Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Patrick Moran. I'm on the marketing team here at H2O.ai. I'd love to start off by introducing our speakers. Uh, Vinod Iyengar uh, comes with over seven years of marketing and data science experience in multiple startups. He brings a strong analytical side and a metrics-driven approach to marketing. And when he's not busy hacking, Vinod loves painting and reading, and he's a huge foodie and will eat anything that doesn't crawl, swim, or move. Now, uh, Boyan Tungas uh, was born in Sarajevo, Bosnia, and Herzegovina. And having fled to Croatia during the war, Boyan came to the U.S. as a high school exchange student to realize his dream of studying physics. A few years ago, he stumbled upon the wonderful world of data science and machine learning and feels like he discovered a second vocation in life. And some of you may know Boyan through his Kaggle uh, competitions and his Grandmaster title. Now, before I hand it over to Boyan and Vinod, I'd like to go over a few webinar logistics. Uh, please feel free to send us your questions through the throughout the session via the questions tab, and uh, we'll be happy to answer them towards the end of the webinar. And secondly, this webinar is being recorded. A copy of the webinar recording and slide deck will be available after the presentation is over. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Vinod. Thank you, Patrick. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today for this uh, really uh, fun discussion, I hope. Um, and I'm really excited uh, to do this webinar with Boyan, who is one of our uh, amazing uh, Kaggle Grandmasters. And actually, as the uh, title slide points out, he's a double Grandmaster, uh, which is a very, very unique thing. I'll let Boyan explain what that means in a bit. But before we get started, um, a quick uh, sort of intro about who we are. Um, for folks who don't know about H2O, we are uh, an open source machine learning company, been in business for about uh, seven years now. Um, we are a really large data science community, so nearly um, uh, 200,000 uh, data scientists, uh, close to 15,000 companies using us on a regular basis, uh, and a lot of the, or half of, the, close to half of the Fortune 500 uh, companies are also using H2 on a regular basis. We have a huge meetup community, um, 100,000 plus meetup members meeting regularly. Um, uh, in different cities around the world, uh, we have a meetup. I think uh, pretty much every week there is a meetup, a uh, meetup in some part of the world. So um, if you're interested, do feel free to join the community and um, learn more about data science. Um, from a product perspective, um, we have uh, these are the products that most of the uh, community knows us for. Um, on the left, you have our open source uh, products, H2O Open Core, uh, which is uh, open source. Um, provides in-memory distributed machine learning with all the popular algorithms that are very commonly used by data scientists. Water, that's uh, H2O running on top of Apache Spark. Uh, again, very uh, very popular, uh, well, probably the, uh, the best machine learning on Spark, as we like to think of it, and our customers validate it. So uh, nearly a third of our open source community uses uh, us through Sparkling Water. And then uh, we ported some of these algorithms to be accelerated on GPUs uh, and created a product called H2O for GPU um, that uh, gives you uh, uh, algorithms like Grain Booster Tree, GLM, Random Forest, PCA, et cetera, uh, fully accelerated on GPU so that you can take advantage of the latest and greatest hardware out there. And finally, Driverless AI is our commercial automatic machine learning platform. Um, that's uh, uh, been our sort of the fastest growing platform in the space right now. Uh, we we automate the entire machine learning workflow uh, from data ingest all the way to production. We'll talk about more about that later in the uh, session, uh, but that's uh, uh, extremely popular built for data scientists, uh, built by the grandmasters, including Boyan, um, and, and it does some really cool stuff. Uh, with that, uh, let's jump into today's topic. Quick. So why AutoML? So, um, so this is a quote from Gartner, one of the reports, um, and this is no news to anyone who's in the industry, right? So there's a deep shortage of data scientists and ML experts, um, and it's not likely to improve in the short term, right? So uh, short to medium term, because the the the, the school, the colleges where, where folks are coming in, they are being only beginning to adapt now to for the, the latest techniques. Another challenge with that is that um, uh, the space is evolving so fast that even when uh, a technique or a set of frameworks are popular uh, uh, today, they may not be popular in a year or two years down the line. So you need to constantly adapt, and that makes it really challenging for uh, creating a corpus of or a pool of uh, experienced data scientists who can keep coming in. Um, and that's a big challenge for enterprises too. So um, the goal is 
can we use AI to build models and uh, help increase uh, the productivity of employees in different enterprises uh, to do this? And that's uh, I want to just put this cartoon up. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, showed it, but uh, the challenge, of course, is with AutoML is that uh, when you show something uh, like AutoML to data scientists um, who are busy coding and uh, cracking away, um, they're too, th too busy to try out something new. Um, and that's why we want to sort of uh, first, uh, spend a little bit of time understanding what AutoML is, what the state of the art is, um, uh, the spaces, and Boyan will sort of, uh, and he has a really good uh, sort of understanding of uh, framework for uh, looking at where AutoML is as a space. And then we'll look at what are the top considerations if you are an enterprise or a data scientist, even uh, if you want to pick an AutoML platform for your company, what should you be looking at? Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Boyan over here. Um, to let him take control and talk about the data sense workflow and the, sort of the six levels of AutoML people. Or do you want? Thank you, Vinod. Um, uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending which time zone you are in. Um, as uh, they mentioned, um, my name is Boyan Tungus. Uh, I'm a Kaggle Grandmaster and a senior data scientist at, at uh, H2O. Uh, this presentation is, has been adapted from a presentation I gave uh, a few months ago at uh, Kaggle Days. Uh, uh, and uh, there I want to kind of take more of a kind of bird's eye view of what uh, machine learning is, what data science is, and how can we automate machine learning and take it from there and uh, understand like what different degrees of uh, automated automation in machine learning may mean. Uh, here we have a, a general kind of data science workflow uh, that you know goes from uh, formulating the problems, uh, acquiring data to data processing, modeling, deployment and then monitoring. Uh, many of these uh, stages are actually included in our driverless AI uh, tools, but for purposes of this kind of bird's eye uh, presentation, I will just concentrate on, on the middle part, on this modeling part. So the modeling modeling uh, is part where you actually all the, have all the data in more or less the shape that you wanted to have, you want it to be. Uh, and you're just having to kind of create the best, most effective model that you can. I said, now, what the best model is will depend on different situations and different, different uh, 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 domains. Uh, many times it, it means just getting the most accurate model, but in many other situations means like most robust or some other uh, thing that needs to be optimized. Uh, but uh, to actually go beyond that, I, I want to kind of start and Kind of make a uh, why would anyone want to kind of have AutoML? So, like uh, AutoML, th there are many reasons. Uh, as Vinod has already mentioned, there's increased demand for data sciences and machine learning uh, applications, uh, demand that's uh, not always uh, being met. Uh, there's a so there's a relative shortage of people with relevant skills, and uh, the, the number of uh, positions is far outstripping number of. Uh, uh, degrees or any kind of certificates that's being offered in the field. Uh, sometimes you just want to try ML on uh, some simple use case with, before you know committing to actually having a data scientist. Yet you want to have it uh, have ML that's as good as, or, or at least close to being as good as something that a data scientist would would produce. So you want to kind of try the waters before you swim in. And then. Uh, then various non-machine learning practitioners, you know, analysts, marketers, IT staff, they want to have uh, some part of their workflow uh, that includes machine learning, but they don't really necessarily need to have a full-time uh, uh, data scientist. So a tool that would do most of the things that the data scientist who, you know, creates machine learning models would do uh, would be useful for them. And then, uh, and then, you know, if, if the tool is good enough and uh, pretty much uh, uh, does everything that you really need it to do, then you can save a lot of money. Instead of uh, hiring a data scientist for, uh, I don't know, $150,000 a year, you can get a tool that's uh, much cheaper than that and then use it on a need-to-need -need basis uh, only when you actually really need and get, get most out of the uh, investment. Uh, Another one is the uh, fast iteration. If you have a tool that actually can do uh, uh, automation and machine learning, it allows you to faster iterate over development. Instead of uh, having to code something and take a few days 
to actually implement in the code. You can actually just uh, take the data, put it in, in inside of a pipeline, and within a few hours, you can actually have an answer to uh, to your question, or actually, or see whether uh, the data that you have can actually answer those kind of questions. And that this is one of my favorites. Uh, if you perform more in more different experiments, you're getting closer to actually really formulating the problem and approaching machine learning problems as a scientist, meaning uh, running experiments, looking at the outcomes and making your decisions and a future uh, iteration based on those decisions. So like, this is one of my mantras, putting science back, back into data science. Um, and then uh, one of the thing is the, uh, the number of people who are entering the data science field is, uh, is uh, increasing. And, uh, you know, there's a comp competition for these jobs. This is actually my son a few months ago. He picked up a book on the neural networks. And uh, I don't know how much uh, he's retained, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a direction where we are headed with uh, data science. So these six levels of AutoML, I was inspired by, if you, you might be familiar with uh, six levels of autonomy in, in uh, uh, driverless cars. So there are different levels. We are pretty much at the level three or four with, with driverless cars, depending who you ask. Um, and uh, uh, fully auto autonomous cars would actually just kind of pick you up from spot A, take you to spot B, without actually really needing to give any, any additional guidance. So I wanted to come up with something similar for automated ML and uh, come up with six different levels. So actually, the first level would be level zero. Uh, which is no automation. You just code stuff from scratch and probably one of the uh, um, low level, relatively low level programming like, languages like C++. And one person who does that to this day is uh, uh, this uh, Austrian grandmaster, Mihail Yar, who I had the privilege of uh, working with. And it, it, uh, looking at his code is just uh, breathtakingly uh, detailed and, and, and uh, uh, Sophisticated, but obviously not most people cannot really uh, implement something like that. Level two would be just uh, use some high level algorithmic APIs like sklearn, Keras, Pandas, H2O, XGBoost, and similar. So that's where most people who are participating on, on Kaggle these days, uh, that's where they are. We, we all rely on some of these tools. And probably the reason that Kaggle has expanded and become so uh, prevalent and popular you know, over the last few years uh, can be easily tracked to like promotion of some of these tools, some of which were actually first introduced uh, on Kaggle. So Keras and XGBoost were actually specifically introduced for Kaggle competitions. Now they become um, they become a uh, uh, standards for a lot of uh, machine learning workflow. Now level two is you automatically tune a hyperparameter and do some assembling and some basic model selection. Um, there. Are Several packages uh, that are similarly high level, like uh, sklearn, that help you op optimize hyperparameter. Uh, they, there's a Bayesian optimization, which is a very popular package. It's the one that I like the most. Um, Hyperops is another one. So there are several different strategies, and many of them are getting automated nowadays for tuning hyperparameters for some of these algorithms. Um, and there's uh, uh, assembling is sort of the, the, the golden uh, standard these days for making the best and most predictive models. Uh, we all know that not, no single model can really outperform an uh, ensemble of different models that, that have been, uh, that each have uh, their own uh, uh, strengths and, and, uh, and peculiarities. So instead, some of the level two automatic uh, machine learning tools can do these assemblings uh, by themselves. And uh, H2O package uh, uh, AutoML is one of them, for instance. It can build several different models, uh, uh, XGBoost, uh, uh, generalized linear model, and a few others, and then assemble them into like a, a very strong um, uh, predictive model. Now, level three is more or less um, where we are at right now uh, as an industry standard, or maybe a little bit of uh, level four. Um, this is where automatic technical feature engineering comes into place. And by that, I mean feature engineering that can be done uh, just using features, you know, technical aspects of the features without really understanding the, the domain where these features are coming from. 
Um, that would be like uh, label encoding for categorical features, uh, target encoding in some cases, uh, binning of different features and, and things like that. So these are technical things that don't really depend uh, by and large on expertise in a particular domain that they can be autom automated and that's where we uh, are right now. Um, another one is the uh, introdu introduction of a graphical user interface, which I think uh, really uh, liberates uh, uh, machine learning from being just a, a toolkit of uh, software engineers and, and uh, data scientists to becoming much more accessible to a really wide spectrum of uh, people who want to use it uh, for their daily work. Uh, now, if you have some kind of very specific domain uh, uh, there, they have a certain feature engineering would only make sense there. Uh, so, in, for instance, in a credit risk uh, 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 loan per income would be a very good uh, feature that otherwise you may not be able to figure out if you're just looking at anonymous features. So this, this will be an example of some um, domain-specific feature engineering. Um, data augmentation is, uh, again, uh, using different, it, this is more the domain-specific uh, domain, uh, data augmentation. Uh, like uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, example of that was recently that I came across a presentation where in order to classify images for different eras, uh, artifacts would be added to those images that would only be relevant to that era. So like if you have a, a 1950s image and you add a, a radio from that era, that could be uh, okay. But if you add an iPhone to that, that would actually be a really bad idea. So that would be some domain specific data augmentation. Um, now for level five, uh, which is the sixth level in, in this taxonomy, that would be full uh, machine learning automation. It's the ability to come up with a superhuman strategies for solving hard machine learning problems without any input or guidance. Uh, and then possibly having fully conversational interaction with a human user. So something that, uh, uh, you know, instead of talking to a data scientist, you could talk uh, to an uh, automation machine learning tool and uh, come up with a strategy of how to how best to uh, uh, formulate a problem and and uh, what kind of uh, model to create. Now we are still pretty far away, you know. Even kind of uh, uh, thinking about this stuff, uh, uh, many people have told me that it sounds more like science fiction than science reality. So the big question is: is uh, full machine, uh, uh, full auto ML, I should say, even possible? Um, According to the uh, free lunch theorem, there is no single approach uh, to any machine learning problem that will outperform all the others. However, we're not really trying to solve any possible, you know, in the universe of possible uh, machine learning problems, problem, but something that's very uh, relevant to real world, which, you know, greatly uh, simplifies and restricts the number of uh, problems that we can solve. And for real world problems, you know, we, we do have people who have uh, expertise in different fields who can actually come up with uh, strategies that we can learn from those. Um, I came up with this term Kaggle optimal solutions, and that would be the best solution that could be obtained through Kaggle competition, provide their no leak, special circumstances, and other exogenous uh, limitations. So uh, Kaggle has been uh, proven to be able to outperform a lot of times even the best domain experts in a in particular field in coming up with solutions. So this would be some kind of superhuman uh, uh, possibility. So if you have enough people working on a problem for an extended period of time who are uh, familiar with the uh, machine learning tools, they can come up with optimal solutions that in many ways uh, no other, uh, no single human could possibly come up with. Now, uh, we know that these solutions do exist because there are Kaggle competitions, and I I'm kind of claiming that this would be, if we can capture this, that would be something that a uh, uh, fully automated machine learning uh, environment could do. And superhuman AutoML would beat uh, best Kaggle almost every time, and that would be something uh, that's still far ahead uh, and uh, not really clear how, to we, uh, how can we get to that point. 
So I'll just briefly, again, go over some of these uh, uh, levels. So no automation. Uh, you implement machine learning algorithm from scratch. It requires far, very high level of software engineering, and it's not easy to actually uh, do uh, uh, for most uh, uh, practitioners of data science. Now, it, this, at this level, in the old days, you know, most of the uh, uh, people who are doing machine learning would actually be writing the tools from scratch, which is obviously not optimal use of their time. And uh, it's very, very hard to scale. Now, for so this is a I'm just giving a logistic regression as implemented in C++, and I'm not sure if you can actually really see it, but it, it's really uh, it's really a bear of, uh, of uh, uh, implementation. And this is uh, my uh, very crude uh, depiction of what uh, making uh, those tools look like back in the days and when we were doing it from scratch. Um, now, there are times where you do want to do something from scratch, namely when you really want to understand some of these uh, algorithms. And there are some good resources out there, including this book that I highly recommend where you do implement some of these algorithms from scratch. You know, if, you, if you, you've been a data scientist for a few years and uh, already have some familiarity with uh, uh, all these algorithms, it would behoove you to kind of take a look and really try to understand and in, try to implement some of them from scratch. Obviously, you can't do uh, fully uh, some of these more complicated residual neural networks from scratch. That would be uh, impossible. But some of the simpler algorithms would definitely be worth uh, your time from an educational perspective to try to do. So now here's a, now, you know, we live in a, a days where there's a really plethora of different uh, APIs to use uh, for building machine learning uh, algorithms, uh, data science pipeline. And uh, if, you, if you're into that stuff, that, then this is really a great place to be. But uh, the problem with this is like pretty much Every day, if not you know, if not several times a day, I, I hear about a new great tool that's being implemented um, that really does part of the, your data science workflow, and it's very hard to keep track of all, all of these things. So it, it's great from a standpoint that many of these uh, can do a lot of things, but it's still very hard to kind of keep track of all the tools that are out there. So high-level like APIs, as I mentioned, like SKLearn, Pandas, XGBoost. Keras, H2O. Um, it allows for novices who you know, still have some coding skills to actually go from uh, building very simple models to being very proficient in a very short amount of time. Uh, it's pretty standardized. Uh, for instance, the SKLearn uh, API is becoming uh, sort of the default these days. And here, for instance, uh, is uh, SKLearn implementation of logistic regression. If you remember that slide from a few slides back uh, where it was implemented in uh, uh, C++, you can immediately see why having these APIs uh, would really make life so much easier for most uh, uh, practicing data scientists. So for level two, we have automatic tuning. Uh, it's, you could consider it first real AutoML. Uh, it's where you start taking several different uh, models, uh, take a data set, uh, specify a target, and let it to create uh, best algorithms out of some subset of algorithms that you can think of. It selects, you know, validation strategy, you know, cross validation versus time validation split. Now, this is still very, in most cases, this automatic uh, cross-validation works, but uh, really hard cases are the ones where uh, there are some peculiarities of the data and you know, simple uh, out-of-time validation or CV validation can actually really burn you. So this is uh, where one of those things where you really need to know that uh, your data is such that some of these cross-validation strategies can work out of the box. And then uh, it optimizes hyperparameters. It chooses the best uh, uh, learning rate, for instance, uh, number of trees, uh, subsampling of, of your data set. So these are all hyperparameters that many of these APIs 
uh, let you pick, but you know, it, it's very hard to come up uh, to understand which ones are the optimal for given problem. And then it uh, performs basic sampling. For instance, if you have two algorithms and they uh, give you predictions, you can take average of those two predictions and that's very simple assembling. But if one is the performing much, but much better than the other one, yet the other one is not completely useless, you know, finding the right kind of weight, it can be tricky. And some of these automatic tools do that for you. Um, so for, for instance, hyperparameter optimization level two is, there are several approaches to it. There's a grid search where you have choose pretty much all the available hyperparameters in some uh, space and then try every one of them. And that's very computationally expensive. Um, random search where you just do subsets of those uh, hyperparameters. And this is the comparison between the two. And then there's Bayesian search, which uses some, uh, uh, uses Bayesian theorem to actually do something very smart about where to look for uh, next uh, potential uh, hyperparameters given the ones that you all did, uh, looked at. And it uses Gaussian uh, uh, process to actually look for uh, different uh, potential hyperparameters. For assembling, um, some of these level one, quote unquote, uh, algorithms are already considered ensembles, like random forest or XGBoost. But we, for all practical purposes, uh, as practicing the, the scientists, we treat them as, as uh, algorithms, uh, as a fundamental algorithm that we want to uh, ensemble with some other one. So we want to take a look, for instance, um, different approaches to assembling, like blending, which is what I mentioned earlier, uh, finding weights of average of weak models, uh, boosting, which is iteratively improving blending, and uh, there's stacking, uh, where you create careful predictions of base models and use those predictions as meta features for your next level model. So these are some of the basic assembling um, approaches. And most of the level two algorithms and level two AutoML solutions can do a pretty good job with these. Okay, so for instance, this is a, an example of a very complicated ensemble uh, where you assemble things at several different levels to, for a final uh, uh, prediction. And this particular uh, example is for my solution for uh, distinguishing between cats and dogs. Now, you would think that this is one of the simplest possible uh, problems that leads to a visualization. You can do some very fancy and very complicated involved assembling, and some of the more advanced uh, machine learning tools can do this for you. Now, for level three, which is where most of the good solutions on the market are right now, we have automatic technical feature engineering and feature selection. Uh, so feature engineering refers to the fact that you create new features or you do something to existing features to make them uh, yield more information. Uh, there are many ways of doing it. Uh, you know, I mentioned some of them binning, uh, finding feature interactions, uh, target encoding. Many of the, these are uh, implemented in, the, in good uh, AutoML solutions. Um, Technical feature selection is a little bit harder to do and it's not very well done by even by most experienced uh, uh, machine learning practitioners. That re requires, once you create many of these new features, which ones to use? Even the ones that you already have, many of them may not be optimal for your problem. So you have a, a, some tool that automatically decides which features of the ones that you created to, to use uh, would be good for the model. And then technical data augmentation is where you, for instance, for images, you can you know, flip, rotate, uh, add some noise, and do that other things. And finally, we have graphical user interface, which uh, makes non-technical people be much more uh, effective with you know, creating uh, good uh, machine learning models that they can use for their own uh, workflow. And, you know, example, uh, analogy I would like to do is uh, if, if you have, you know, word processing versus uh, uh, typesetting everything in LaTeX, uh, this makes, you know, 
more people be able to uh, write very uh, uh, good looking and, and, and uh, effective documents, even though they don't have any particular uh, low level technical skills. So here's automatic feature engineering. Um, you can use different coding for categorical data. You can use uh, different codings of numerical data, aggregations, and feature interactions. So these are all things that they can do, uh, you can do with uh, tabular data. Now, word embedding is when you have textual data and you actually turn text into some kind of vector in some vector space. And then for images, uh, you can have pre-trained uh, uh, neural networks that can actually turn image into, again, uh, array that you can then use for um, uh, other machine learning algorithms. And now for technical feature selection, we have things like uh, selecting features based on feature importance and some test model. Uh, you train a model, see which features are most uh, uh, relevant, and then just keep top, I don't know, five of those. Uh, you have things like forward feature selection, where you select feature, uh, see how it performs, add another feature, see if the model improves, then keep that feature, and if it doesn't, uh, uh, throw it away. So go one by one through all the features until you find a set that's really uh, works well with uh, your given model. Uh, the opposite is recursive feature elimination, where you actually t start with all the features you have and then eliminate one by one all of them. Now, all of these are very computationally intensive and not may maybe optimal for most uh, problems, especially if you if number of features easily can go into thousands of tens of thousands after uh, some of the feature engineering. There's also permutation impact, where you just take one uh, feature out at a time and see how it works without that feature. So as I mentioned before, generating new features, you know, results in combinatorial exposure of possible features, uh, and we need some more sophisticated strategies uh, to actually select features that would be useful for our model. And this is what, what some of the best uh, AutoML tools that our market uh, right now can do for you. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the approaches for this is genetic programming, where you evolve, quote unquote, features, and then look at which ones survive and create a new subset of features based on those evolutionary algorithms. And that's something that's, uh, for instance, uh, implemented in uh, H2O's uh, driverless AI. Now, when it comes to technical data augmentation, um, there are many different things that you can do. Uh, for instance, adding stock value prices to temporal data. If you want to look at uh, how economy is performing or some other financial uh, uh, indicator is performing well, you can look at add stock prices over time to see like if there's some correlation between uh, stock market and default rates for some kind of loan. Uh, you can add geographical information. This is something that's uh, very informative, but uh, with this one, uh, you have to be very careful that you don't introduce some kind of uh, regional biases in your models which for regulatory purposes uh, can be a uh, uh, questionable practice. And for instance, FICO scores can be another important uh, additional uh, piece of information. If you're running a loan business, FICO scores obviously would be a great piece of information to have. Uh, then there's this trick that uh, uh, some of our teams uh, uh, on Kaggle competitions have discovered where you uh, have textual data and you do some kind of automated translation of the text into another language and then translating back in the original language. That introduced some noise, and uh, the uh, hope is that uh, this noise would actually uh, help you with the uh, ensemble of the model that you're building. And again, this is very technically straightforward. There's nothing, no human in the loop uh, in this process, and no understanding of either one of the languages that needs to be involved. And injecting noise is a tried and tested way of uh, dealing with uh, data augmentation. Uh, and then you can do various math transformations and sound and uh, images and other things. 
Um, then there is image specific transformation, blurring, brightening, color, saturation, etc. So there are a lot of different ways that the technical uh, data augmentation can be done. There are libraries out there that do it for you, but there are good solutions, uh, AutoML solutions that also do it in the background. GUI is, again, one of the things that I think uh, every level three uh, AutoML needs to have. Uh, it facilitates interaction with software. Uh, allow for many non-technical people to use it and uh, for facilitate iteration and development. Now, level four is beyond where we are right now. Uh, it uh, requires uh, uh, automating specific feature engineering. Uh, it requires the ability to combine several different data sources into a single one on uh, or suitable for ML exploration. So if you have, again, I like going back to the uh, loan business uh, 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 problem. If you have different tables that are, uh, that come from a different aspects of the uh, loan process, uh, how you combine these tables into a single one that can be suitable for machine learning is uh, is non-trivial. Uh, you know, how do you aggregate data from uh, a transaction history or whatnot? That's None of these things are uh, easy to do. And uh, we don't have automated way of doing it to this day. You know, some domain specific uh, case, uh, cases may have it, but in general, we don't have autom automatic uh, 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 feature generation. Uh, you can do some advanced hyperparameter tuning uh, where you, you go beyond Bayesian optimization and some of those things that we mentioned before. Um, automated uh, uh, domain problem specific feature engineering where you do aggregations according to like what makes make sense for instance for for your problem uh, adding particular kind of noise to images that really makes sense for those kind of uh, images and no others so these are very to this they require a lot of uh, human interaction and human understanding of the problem then ability to combine several different uh, uh, data sources joining tables uh, understanding which merges make sense in executing them. Uh, understanding which aggregations make sense. So all these things still require a lot of human interaction. Uh, advanced hyperparameter tuning. Um, manual hyperparameter tuning is still my number one go-to approach for tuning hyperparameters. I, I've tried many of these uh, uh, packages and I can still by using my own intuition and experience with uh, tuning some of these uh, XGBoost, for instance, the algorithms, I can still come up with a better uh, hyperparameter than any of these auto uh, solutions out there. So it, there's still a lot of intuition and human understanding of uh, that's involved that we still are not able to completely capture. Um, so, you know, this is a deep understanding of the data. Um, it may require some transfer uh, learning. So building uh, hyperparameters based on the previous experience with different hyperparameters. So for specific feature engineering, um, so domain understanding uh, will be crucial to create different uh, uh, features. Uh, ability to get additional data based on the problem and domain and integrate into the ML pipeline that's still very much where uh, real world data scientists come into play. And now we're going to full ML automation. This is a little bit beyond what even we are able to kind of uh, foresee right now. But this is, I feel, where what fully automated machine learning with solution would look like. It requires ability to come up with superhuman strategies for solving hard ML problems without any input or guidance. Uh, fully conversational interaction with a human user. So this would be essentially having a Kaggle Grandmaster uh, sitting in front of you and solutions to your problem. So up to level four, all of the automation is essentially hard coded. So it's still you know something that uh, you have to come up with uh, uh, a prior to deploying the solution and then having solution run itself. But now for full automation, we need to use machine learning approach to uh, how to build it. Uh, and what that means is 
use machine learning to teach AutoML systems how to do machine learning. So it, it, machine learning is approach to building software and products uh, that requires a lot of data. Now, we would really require a lot of data and use cases of how to build machine learning pipelines and then train a model on all of them to actually come up with a better superhuman uh, approach. We might need some unsupervised uh, approach. So this would be machine learning for machine learning for machine learning. So um, uh, the idea in principle is simple. Give the ML system a large collection of ML problems and their solution, and then let it learn how to build ML systems. Now, Idea is simple, execution is hard because we still have relatively few machine learning problems to work with. Uh, it's very daunting. Even the simplest ML problem requires thousands of instances to train on for decent performance. However, we probably don't need to build all these uh, all this from scratch. We might be able to bootstrap on top of the previous level of automation. So if you have all these previous levels and it's working fine. Uh, then you can do something maybe like reinforcement learning. Or you can use unsupervised techniques. If we can parameterize our problems and parameterize possible solutions to them, um, then we can come up with a you know, space or universe of human relevant ML problems. Uh, we might be able to find some patterns in there. So uh, unsupervised uh, methods are much better suited for situation where you don't have too much data, but you still want to understand uh, something about it and, and come up with uh, solutions. And then there's reinforcement learning. Uh, building ML solutions and based on how well they perform, adjust the architecture. So this would be, you know, have an environment where machine learning tools can actually learn from the experience of trying to solve machine learning problems. Uh, so this would be a adversarial AutoML. Have AutoML system compete against each other, make a kind of competition that's only open to AutoML systems and iterate. So this is a, a possible uh, something that, that could come in the future uh, where you have different AutoML systems compete with each other and learn from the experience. And, and I would argue that fully conversation interaction with human user would be another thing that you would need from such a system. So again, it wouldn't, you know, this would be AutoML system that doesn't necessarily pass the full uh, Turing test, but uh, has enough of a domain specific understanding of machine learning that can pass Turing test for a machine learning problems and be able to interact with you like you would with any other uh, data scientist. Um, it would democratize machine learning and make it even more accessible than it is right now. Uh, and to, you know, a lot of times, even formulating machine learning problem is a very iterative process where you interact with people, uh, you know, domain experts, other uh, data scientists, uh, analysts, to actually come up with something that's really uh, can be really uh, useful for everyone. And actually, uh, there are a few downsides, but I, I'm not going to uh, spend too much time uh, on these. I'm just going to click through them because I want to hand it over to Vinod, who will uh, introduce you a little bit more to our uh, driverless AI system. All right. Thank, thank you, Brian. Um, so this is uh, extremely uh, useful to understand sort of where the state of the space is, right? So um, in a nutshell, sort of to recap what I said, you know, uh, I, I think of them almost like Gen 1, uh, which is basically a lot of the open source frameworks which do hyperparameter tuning, ensembling, and uh, sort of leaderboard sort of approach. Um, then you have Gen 2, which uh, I talked about, is kind of, kind of level 3 and level 4, where you're getting to feature engineering, evolutionary genetic algorithm type techniques to do a lot of the work. Um, and then going forward to like uh, Gen 3, which is basically uh, kind of like getting the full on ML, where uh, AI is available sort of at the fingertips. I know as you're looking at data, so it's using new interfaces too, like in different places. Uh, now with that said, um, if you're uh, an organization or a data scientist looking to pick a platform to do auto ML, what should you be looking at today? So based on what uh, the state of the industry is, uh, here are the top considerations in my mind. So um, to begin with, think of, hey, how can you can you automate the entire workflow? So, uh, I know Brian mentioned this earlier, uh, where we specifically talked about the feature engineering and modeling, but essentially if you think the entire workflow is data prep, data ingest, 
And at the downstream, you have model deployment monitoring. So how uh, can your platform sort of automate as much as possible so that you can spend more time thinking about the problem framing and actually evaluating if it's doing the right thing? Uh, look at uh, portability and flexibility becomes important. We'll spend a little bit more time thinking about it, but what that means is um, you don't want to be locked into one vendor or one environment. So um, there are considerations around where the data is. Is it on cloud, on-prem? Uh, where is the compute running? Um, or what about uh, running it in different sort of uh, hardwares like uh, GPUs or using, uh, using GPUs or CPUs or the latest uh, uh, processors for that matter, and then um, running them in sort of in different uh, configurations as well. Along with that, it also comes the idea of extensibility. So until now, we've been thinking about automation, but um, as I mentioned, uh, you're never going to get to full automation, really. So uh, in the interim, can you extend it? Can you customize the platform, add your own sort of uh, flavor to it? So these could be or these could be new algorithms that uh, the platform may not have today, uh, but other ways to add those. Uh, so that's an important consideration. And finally, um, explainability, trust, and transparency. That becomes really important. Um, uh, with automation, it becomes even more critical because essentially now you kind of have a mass, master black box. So if you think the algorithms are black boxes themselves, now you have a master black box, which does AutoML. You go give it data, and it gives you a model and a prediction. Uh, so if you can't explain uh, uh, and validate the model, uh, then that becomes a big challenge. So thinking about uh, what tools are available to uh, achieve that is a big consideration when you're picking a platform. Uh, and, then, and then you also want feature proofing, right? So part of the reason why you're doing AutoML is uh, as one person um, cannot learn everything or be able and master and everything, and it goes back to the no free lunch theorem. Uh, I have my own take on it. It's, there's a no free lunch theorem for data scientists as well. No one data scientist is an expert in every single field. Um, like even in Kaggle, uh, we have some folks who are uh, deep learning uh, experts, uh, some folks who are uh, GBM experts, some folks who focus on feature engineering, right? So you want the tool or the platform to do a lot, all of it for you and find the latest and greatest in every single field. So think about that, it uh, becomes critical. So just to extend that a little bit further, right? So when you look at the challenges in the AI model development workflow, um, and uh, there is feature engineering, model building, and model deployment at a high level, but even within those, there are sections, right? You know, looking at things like simple encoding, advanced encoding, feature engineering, feature generation, uh, which is you know, looking at interaction effects or transformations. Um, and then within the model building part of itself, you have the algorithm selection, uh, what framework to use, tuning of the parameters and then ensembling uh, that Boyan uh, touched upon quite a bit. And then when it comes to deployment, you are looking at uh, can you generate a pipeline, can you easily deploy it, can you monitor it, can you explain the results and then document the whole workflow. Um, and all of these are time-consuming uh, like tasks because each of them require a lot of work, uh, they are often iterative, um, and you have to often hand code them. So look at tools that can mount, like sort of automate the entire workflow. And uh, at H2O, for example, we have two AutoML sort of offerings. One is the H2O open source AutoML that's very widely used, and that basically focuses on the model building part. Right? So it automates the model building part thoroughly. So it does all the algorithm selection for you, the parameter tuning, and then the ensembling. But it also does some simple encoding and generates a pipeline, at least for the model building portion. Um, and then when you jump over to H2O Travelist AI, uh, we, what we set out to do is solve as much as possible for the entire workflow, right? So we took the remaining pieces as well and automated it. Uh, so that becomes useful for you to see when you're picking a platform. Um, now coming to the portability and flexibility question, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, you're really uh, looking at saying that, hey, um, can your platform run on cloud? Can your platform run on uh, in a hybrid fashion, kind of on-prem, and what are the considerations when you're doing that in a different way? So, for example, if you want, uh, as your data size increases, you want the ability to run it in a distributed fashion, the ability to uh, uh, handle larger data sets, handle varied data sets, for example, um, and those become critical. Um, for example, data sources uh, could be coming from whole different places, right? So you cannot restrict yourself to one single data source. Uh, it could be coming from on-prem or cloud. Uh, and then integrations, because um, there's a whole bunch of tools in, in the arena uh, that you probably are going to be needing to use along with your AutoML platform. So uh, think about uh, picking platforms which can integrate as much as possible with other tools. So if you already have certain uh, set of tools for data managing, for example, data prep, uh, or even for infrastructure management, uh, the ability to integrate with existing frameworks and platforms is critical. 
uh, in the same breath, also think about all the different data sources that your data might be coming in, right? So you cannot just have uh, the simple CSVs or the TSVs, but um, uh, there's big data formats, there is uh, uh, data frameworks, data frames which are coming from uh, different platforms. Uh, you want the ability, uh, you want a breadth of connectors and ingestion sources. Um, so what does this look like? So, the, so uh, these are some examples that we published ourselves with some of our partners, right? So um, uh, the, when you talk about flexibility, so this is a cloud deployment that uh, a lot of our customers do. So data coming in from Snowflake and other data warehouses from the cloud, um, uh, pulled in through data Alteryx through do the data prep, and then driverless AI for the feed changing and model building. And all of this running on either AWS or Azure or GCP. Uh, this is just one deployment uh, reference architecture that's very popular with our customers. But uh, very similar to that, we can do a hybrid one. And again, um, instead of uh, running through cloud-wide data viruses, you're running it on something like BlueData, which in turn connects to uh, on-prem HDFS, but also uh, box storages. Again, uh, using some data prep tool in between, and then running this, uh, running the feature engineering and machine learning in driverless AI. So the environments you run are going to be very different. And if I flip this to a completely on-prem-based solution, now you're looking at data integration from a whole bunch of data sources like uh, SQL data warehouses or HDFS or just file systems uh, like Menu. Uh, and pulling that in to do the data quality transformation in something like Spark, for example, and then uh, running the feature changing and model building in driverless AI. So uh, you want the platform to be flexible across all these sort of different type of deployments. And as you're considering that, um, think about these things, right? Like data gravity becomes critical. As your data uh, size gets larger and larger, you don't really want to ship it across. So um, uh, find a platform that can run close to your data, right? So um, if, you, if you can, uh, that way you can avoid shipping the data over the network. Uh, it also makes for a lot of uh, sort of like a very secure connection in the sense that uh, uh, oftentimes some of these data might have privacy, uh, private data, uh, PII information, or HIPAA uh, compliant data, in which case you don't want them to be sent to different places without a lot of uh, careful vetting. So uh, if everything can run in your own secure firewall BPC, then it's perfect. Um, similarly, look at frameworks. So, um, you know, you, there's no um, single sort of tool or solution. I and mean, this space is rapidly evolving too. So uh, uh, you need to know what you don't know, right? Like having an awareness of what you're not uh, good at uh, is important so that you can have the platform find the best ideas for you. So that the latest technologies, latest techniques, new networks, new architectures, um, can you be the first market? So uh, pick a platform that can give you that velocity of uh, innovation uh, and impl implement that for your company. And finally, similarly in the same breath, you have hardware too. So there's a lot of improvements and progress happening on the hardware front. Uh, the latest CPUs and GPUs are much, much faster than uh, even like a couple of years ago. And especially when it comes to RTML, it is a very, very compute intensive or resource intensive operation. So you do want to take advantage of the latest uh, innovations there. So find platforms that can uh, take advantage of uh, uh, like the latest A6 GPUs or uh, or you know uh, FPGAs for that matter, whatever you can, right? So that becomes critical. Um, yeah, and this is just an example of how, like for example, driverless AI, we are able to run this on completely different configurations uh, using, uh, say, like something like Optane DC memory, persistent memory from Intel uh, with DRAM with a very uh, heavily uh, uh, overloaded sort of uh, persistent memory and the latest CPU infrastructure. And uh, conversely, on the other side, uh, with the latest sort of DJX1 and DJX2, we can run on uh, GPUs as well. So up to 16 GPUs scaled on a single machine with 32 gigs of uh, GPU memory each can give you some phenomenal performance as well. So we can, uh, find platforms that can take advantage of the latest hardware. Right? So this is a good couple of good examples over here. Let's talk about extensibility for a second. What I mean by that is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, so you you want, uh, at least we think of it this in three different ways, right? So uh, first is, uh, even if your platform does some automatic feature engineering, what about other stuff that you know as a domain expert? Can you bring those in? So custom feature engineering is important, right? Uh, doing your own transformations, your own uh, uh, domain-specific interactions, for example, bringing them into the platform, can the platform take advantage of them? Uh, custom algorithms, um, obviously there's a whole bunch of different like the uh, uh, frameworks out there which are really good at certain like a bunch of different uh, problems, but there's new stuff coming all the time. So you you want to be able to try new stuff and see quickly if that makes sense for you. So uh, having the ability to bring custom ML 
uh, algorithms is critical. And finally, custom loss functions. So this is uh, this is the part which is going to be very tough to automate, anyways, right? Where uh, this is the part that you know very well. So you know what your customer's lifetime value is. So uh, a churn of a highly valued customer as compared to a not so valuable customer is very different. So you want your loss function to be optimized for that. You want their um, to optimize for business metrics that are important for you. So can your platform uh, find a platform that allows you to do that? And um, in driverless AI, for example, we have now uh, the ability to add custom transformers. Literally, you can bring in your own Python code, uh, simple Python recipe that can do this for you. Um, and it's just one way of doing it. And we are using a very simple scikit-learn style API, so any data scientist can uh, implement their own transformer uh, or their own custom model. Um, and then the driverless AI's engine will use them just as if they were native. So that's important. But along with that, uh, look for platforms that uh, give you a whole community of open source recipes, right? So you don't, um, oftentimes you'll find is that you'll want to use recipes that are already pre-built. So find one, uh, find a platform that has a pre-built community because then you can reuse and repurpose and there's a lot of collaboration that happens. Things get better. So um, uh, instead of just picking a platform that uh, does all the work themselves, um, obviously no company can um, uh, add so many people, the community is obviously larger, and right? especially if you can take advantage of the Kaggle community, which has some, some phenomenal scripts and recipes, can you bring them into one platform? Uh, so the final part topic I want to touch on very quickly in a few minutes is about explainability. So trust, transparency, and explainability, they're critical. Why do they matter, right? So um, obviously, uh, as you're doing, you're kind of automatically kind of takes into the black box realm a little bit, right? So uh, because you're letting the machine pick all the, make all the choices, the parameters, the features, the tuning, uh, and it's even the algorithms, right? So everything is being done by the machine. So you essentially have a big black, bigger black box now, um, and you have to sort of figure out uh, what's the trade-off between you know interpretability and uh, performance. So. Uh, there's obviously a lot of, lot of techniques like you know using surrogate models for example or even uh, getting approximate explanations um, consider like you know those are important can your platform sort of show you look for those uh, as you're making decisions over here um, similarly um, there's obviously the multiplicity of good models right so uh, again goes back to the no free lunch theorem um, if there's a lot of different models uh, which ones do you pick? So um, uh, the, the same objective metrics, can you pick a one, pick a, pick a, pick a model which is simpler to understand and more interpretable, uh, uh, but you know, at the same time gives you performance which is similar to or close enough to the best model out there, right? Um, so that's important. Uh, fairness uh, and social aspects, these are becoming more and more critical. So um, as is, especially ML models are becoming very prevalent in like things like credit scoring, for example, or even uh, healthcare use cases, uh, it's critical to uh, evaluate if uh, that the model doesn't uh, buy, bring in human bias in or uh, build discriminatory models that can uh, discriminate on the basis of gender, age, ethnicity, et cetera, right? So um, how do you do that? So you want techniques that can help uh, identify disparate impact and help uh, remediate it, right? So, find uh, tools that can help you do that and see if your platform supports that. Uh, trust is, is of course critical. So uh, you want a whole bunch of sort of model debugging tools. So think about ways to debug the models. There's obviously the classic techniques, uh, data mining techniques like you know PDP, uh, variable importances, Shapley, et cetera. But go beyond, going beyond that, what other techniques are available to help uh, sort of uh, debug the model and understand how well it's performing in real world, right? So. Uh, giving giving that level of granularity in the predictions on each individual prediction is important. Uh, finally, the last pieces are security and hacking. So this is uh, a very, very new topic, and I highly recommend uh, watching the webinar that we did um, by Patrick Hall, uh, who has a full webinar on this topic. But uh, there's a blog as well. But uh, uh, can you use these techniques to understand if there are, uh, if your model is vulnerable to certain sort of regions of the space, right? So can your model be hacked by uh, some inputs which are designed to uh, fool the model, right? So uh, how do you do that? So uh, like finding uh, different, using different techniques to identify those things and solve for those, building adversarial models, adversarial data sets to actually tune your, uh, like find those weak spots for your model. Uh, so think about those uh, considerations as well, especially when you're using AutoML because you don't know what actually went into it. You may not know fully. 
Uh, and then regulatory and control environments, this becomes very critical. This is something that we tackle all the time. A lot of the, some of the largest banks, healthcare companies, insurance companies use our models in production. So there are legal requirements to be able to explain every single prediction. For example, if you uh, deny credit to someone, you have to explain exactly why that happened, why the decision is made. Um, uh, similarly, if you are going to uh, make addition on an insurance payment uh, or denying a claim, you got to explain as well. So um, uh, fairness, uh, and, uh, uh, and and the bias sort of reduction are important as, uh, considerations as well. So think about all these things when you're making addition on what platform to buy. Ask these questions of your vendor. Um, and obviously, you know, we at H2O uh, are very focused on these things. That's why we're talking about this. But uh, we truly believe that this is important for the space. So uh, as an enterprise, and oftentimes we are in front of customers who ask us these questions, we tell the same thing. Um, with that, uh, I think we are at the end of the deck, but um, I know we ran out of time. Um, we probably don't have any time for Q&A, but I recommend posting the questions. We'll try to get back with answers on those. Um, I want to thank um, uh, Boyan here for jumping in last minute for this uh, webinar. Uh, gave a really wonderful overview on the space of AutoML. Uh, we hope that this was uh, fruitful and productive and uh, informative. Um, but uh, uh, the presentation will basically want to thank everyone who joined us today, and we'll send the slides and recording over shortly. Thank you.